Hi, I'm Meta Spencer. Today we're going to talk again about the Arctic and about refreezing the Arctic Ocean. And of course, we can't just immediately run out and refreeze the Arctic Ocean. But we have some people who have some ideas how about how we might approach that project and make it uh, at least ascertain whether and how we can go about doing it. And uh, some of my experts are in uh, Europe and some in North America. Uh, Stephen Salter is at the University of Edinburgh, and he's uh, one of the great proponents of the notion that we can refreeze the Arctic. But let's uh, the project that uh, Bugwash is going to start with is the idea of refreezing just a part of Hudson Bay every summer so that we can keep it um, keep some ice there um, year round, not the whole thing, but uh, part of the bay. And then that will be a, a good experiment to see how well uh, we might be able to use the same principles to uh, on a larger scale that other countries might want to participate in. But Canada alone can do this project about the uh, Hudson Bay because we own Hudson Bay, it's part of us. And uh, so the idea would be to spray uh, sea water or salt water through very uh, fine nozzles so that tiny particles of, of salt water uh, go up into the clouds and brighten them by making the, the overall composition of the clouds uh, uh, smaller droplets, which are whiter. And these whiter clouds will reflect more of the sunlight coming in and uh, thereby keep the water below uh, colder. So that's the general notion that we're going to explore again today because we've already talked about this. If you, Some of you will have um, already seen uh, shows that we've done discussing this issue before. So this is the thing that Stephen Salter is the, the guru. Um, and uh, in uh, I'm going to speak to uh, Peter Wadhams as well, because Peter is somebody who's very much uh, in, in alignment with this. Peter is a great expert on Arctic ice, sea ice, and he's now in Turin, Italy. And uh, in uh, someplace in the south uh, part of England is Alan Gadian. Alan is a, a climatologist who uh, does a lot of uh, modeling. So I think he's a, he's a guy who does the, the number crunching. Uh, if I'm uh, maybe uh, uh, simplifying the whole thing a little bit too much. Uh, and uh, in uh, Boulder, Colorado, uh, is Michael Diamond. And uh, uh, Michael Diamond is uh, going to be, uh, he's an expert on aerosol and clouds and that sort of thing. Those folks out at uh, the University of Colorado at Boulder seem to have a, a whole uh, institute or something that does that uh, uh, must have dozens of, of uh, scientists working there who all specialize on clouds. And uh, so uh, he's he's going to answer some questions that basically arose for me as, um, as I uh, uh, watched uh, a video uh, by uh, a woman named Jennifer Francis, who's uh, uh, also a climatologist and, and who remarked something in passing that the um, uh, that clouds have an overall effect of warming the climate. Therefore, my thought was, well, if that's true, then our whole project may sound uh, a little uh, suspicious because if we're going to warm the planet when we're trying to cool it, uh, we got to work something out here to make sure we're not uh, contradicting ourselves. So uh, I, I wanted to have Jennifer uh, uh, Francis join us today, but she couldn't, and therefore she recommended a series of people who recommended other people, and which is how I got to Michael Diamond. Um, and uh, the the point of this series of uh, of, of uh, inquiry uh, ha is that we are now conducting a, an investigation of this whole notion of cloud brightening to uh, cool the planet. Um, by uh, by Pugwash Ice. The Canadian Pugwash Group is uh, sending people who, well, I'm a member, and uh, Ellen Judd is also a member uh, in uh, Manitoba. And uh, so is uh, Michelle Dubois, who is a physics professor at uh, 
Laval University in Quebec. Uh, and uh, they are both active in the, in the Canadian Pugwash movement. We may be joined by some other Pugwashites. Maybe, Stephen, uh, uh, why don't you begin by correcting any, any mistakes I have made in this little introduction? And, and then we can ask people to generally comment on whether they think that the uh, the overall project of, uh, of brightening the clouds over Hudson Bay is a reasonable uh, project that uh, that we might uh, endorse. Right. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. The, the first the first correction is that the uh, acknowledge the work of John Latham and Sean Toomey. Uh, I'm just an engineer who's trying to do things that John Latham asked me to do. And really, the, the whole of this this thing started off with Sean Toomey's work and John Latham, who was in Boulder, Colorado. So the, the, they're the guys who you could blame if it doesn't work. The second thing is that I'm painfully learning bits of uh, climate physics. And I agree with Jennifer Francis, from whom I have a lot of respect that sometimes clouds will cool and sometimes clouds will warm. And it depends on the height that they're released at, they're forming at, and it depends on the size of the drops in the cloud. And there's some very interesting work done at the Cicero Labs in Norway by uh, Altersgaier, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, and Christensen, that showed that if you have rather small uh, aerosol, that warms, and if you have aerosol that's too big, that warms as well. And I was very puzzled about this. Uh, fortunately, the size of drops that I want to make for re engineering reasons is exactly in the right place for what they're saying. And the reason that big drops might be cooling is that they uh, fall fast enough to gob gobble up other big drops, and that can make rain, and that can clear clouds. And if you've cleared the clouds by spraying with big aerosols, then uh, there'll, there'll be overall warming because you cleared the clouds away. The second possibility for very small aerosol is that they, uh, if you've got very large numbers of very small aerosol, they aren't big enough to do proper nucleation. They don't grow a big drop on them, but they can still take out quite a lot of water vapor, uh, which is transparent. And that will let more um, uh, uh, sunlight come through because there's such a very large number of things that you're reducing the liquid water content in, in the cloud. So fortunately, uh, the sizes that we would like to make for reasons about making metals filtration, filtration are very neatly in between the two regions that the Norwegians say will warm. Uh, we know that if you have very high altitude clouds, cirrus clouds, they will reflect back uh, uh, outgoing energy. Instead of letting it go out to deep space, they'll reflect it back. Now, let me get it clear. You're saying that high, high altitude clouds... High altitude clouds could reflect outgoing wave energy, uh, solar energy, back down to ground. And that's why we don't want that to happen. And that's that it's going to reflect it downwards, so that's going to be a heating effect. The heating stuff. We also and the, and the lower level clouds reflect it yeah. upward and cool, therefore a cooling effect, right? We also know that at night time and in winter time, any clouds will reflect back uh, energy. Right. So it depends on the height and the time of year, time of day, even and the size of the aerosols. It's a very complicated issue and fortunately uh, on, let, let me make sure i get you uh, at night all clouds do what yeah they will reflect back all at night all clouds have a heating effect yes. and in the daytime the low level clouds have a, uh, a the, cooling effect. You down. okay uh, to complete the picture meta the uh, sunlight coming down is uh, short wave um, called shortwave radiation, and that heats the surface of the Earth. Now, when you heat something, it emits uh, long-wave radiation, longer wavelengths, and those longer wavelengths are what's captured by the greenhouse gases, 
those longer wavelengths are what are what are reflected back by the high cirrus clouds mm. in the daytime. The the short the lower clouds are reflecting back the short wave radiation um, that's coming down. Um, there also um, will there also will be some conversion, uh, to some you know heating of the atmosphere, and and that long wave radiation is also reflected back up. But it's mostly the short wave that's reflected by the low level clouds. So they cool, high level clouds, uh, you know, they cause the warming. This is during the day. During the night, of course, it's, there's no incoming shortwave radiation. It's dark, right? Mm -hmm. So it's only the long wave radiation, the heat, the heat generated radiation that, that you need to think about. Oh, that's helpful. Okay. I didn't realize you were here. Uh, Paul, I, sh I should have introduced you. This is Paul Beckwith. And, and and Michael Diamond has raised his hand as if he's a polite man, but we don't have to be polite here. You can just <laughs> speak up. <laughs> yes, Michael. Yeah, I was just going to echo exactly what um, Stephen and Paul said really well. Um, and just maybe add a little bit of um, a caveat that it helps us to think both at um, what we consider the top of the atmosphere. So kind of where the earth is exchanging energy with space and at the surface. Um, so all clouds are going to interact with both of those types of energy we just talked about. So they're going to interact with sunlight or shortwave radiation, um, and they're going to interact with um, this heat radiation or infrared radiation or long wave radiation. All those kind of mean the same, the same thing. Um, taking the perspective from the top of the atmosphere right now, where we're exchanging energy with space, um, these low clouds that are our main target for marine cloud brightening they are very reflective. So they, at least in the daytime, are gonna reflect a lot of that sunlight back to space. So that's their cooling effect. And at the same time, this um, clouds act very similarly to greenhouse gases, actually. So they absorb the infrared radiation that gets to them and then they re-emit it at a new temperature. So these clouds that are near the surface, they are relatively warm, which means that their ability to trap the radiation in the Earth's system is relatively low. So they have a very small warming effect um, overall. These high clouds, especially let's think about those thin cirrus, you've probably seen these, maybe an airplane comes by and you see this like um, thin contrail after and you can still see the blue sky through it. They're not that reflective, right? You can actually see totally through them. So they have a weak cooling effect but they are very high up in the atmosphere, which means they absorb that radiation and then they re-emit it, but they re-emit it at a very cold temperature. And um, cold things emit less than warm things is kind of the fundamental physics there. So they basically act to trap that radiation in the earth system, um, same way that greenhouse gases do and they cause a warming. So that's why from the earth to space perspective, you have um, a big difference between these low clouds, which mainly cool the climate and these thin high clouds, which mainly act to warm the climate. Overall, um, clouds, if you take all the clouds everywhere on Earth, day and night, average them all together, it's a pretty strong cooling effect. But regionally, you get some mm. areas of warming. And this is, might be what um, Jennifer was referring to in the video. I should just um, have an asterisk here. I did not see her video, unfortunately. So um, apologies for anything I get wrong. I don't want to put any words in her mouth. Can but, I, um, can I in, add a... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Please Can I add a complication here? <clears throat> and that is the biggest greenhouse gas in the atmosphere is water vapor. Mm -hmm. And this is governed by a thing called the clausius clapron equation, which is covered in high school physics. And essentially, about 30% of the greenhouse effect comes from water vapor. So the complication if you increase the temperature of the lower atmosphere that's below three four kilometers by one degree celsius you increase the effective warming by seven percent so there's a positive feedback here that i mean clouds have a role a very the low level clouds have a very important especially the strata cumulus clouds layer clouds but the the most important role is the fact that water vapor exists in the lower atmosphere it's far more important than methane far more important than carbon dioxide so you're 
this feedback effect. So when one talks about the infrared uh, absorption and re-emission downwards of clouds, the complication is that water vapor does this incredibly efficiently. So you've got this positive feedback. And if you increase the effectively, if you increase the temperature of the lower atmosphere by two degrees Celsius, which is what we're all talking about now, and I believe it's gone beyond two degrees anyway, you essentially will almost increase the infrared heating by 50 to 60 percent. So you're getting a feedback effect. And the clouds can mitigate this. One of the arguments is the more water vapor in the lower clouds layer, the more lower level clouds you're getting. But you're battling against uh, a, a battle against this positive feedback that you get. So the, the, the issue with low level clouds and high level clouds is very important and critical. But the other background issue that people ignore is the fact that if you warm up the lower atmosphere, you're likely to get not as high as Venus, but you're going to get more and more positive feedback. And people keep forgetting that critical fact. Right, I, I just wanna add that the, the closest uh, Clapeyron equation, you know, if you increase temperature one degree Celsius, that actually increases the ability of the atmosphere to hold water by that 7%. Yeah, so right. you, you have to have a source of evaporation for that water vapor to go up in the atmosphere, that 7%. If you're over a dry area, you know, you're going to increase the ability of the air. Hot air can hold more water. You're going to increase the ability of the hot air to hold the water, but it won't necessarily be, mm -hmm. be realized in the atmosphere because there's not a, not a vapor, water vapor source. Yeah, but most of the Earth is covered with water. <laughs> yeah, people, yeah. people living in the Northern Hemisphere, one forgets this fact, but in reality, yeah. the, the Earth is totally an aqua planet, essentially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I wonder yeah. if somebody can help me here because I've gotten you're 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 above my head, and my job as a journalist <laughs> is to try to make sure that whatever we put out there for the public is something the public can grasp and I've gotten mm -hmm. lost. So I'm not sure where I got lost or what I need to do to get back onto the level of intelligibility. Like like but the hotter air, hotter air is, a, is able to hold much more water. So if you cool down the atmosphere, you can get dew appearing on the grass from condensation. Like any cold surfaces, you get water condensation because it's, the air can no longer hold as much water as it held before at a higher temperature. So that's all. Uh, when you increase the temperature a degree Celsius, the air can hold about 7% more water vapor. That's uh, from this equation, um, which is called the clausius clapeyron You can just go on Wikipedia and, and look okay, at it if you want more that, detail. Now, that's can, really I, can I give you another example? Another example. Yeah. If you go and camp on the Great Divide, 12,000 feet, right? Mm -hmm. There is very little water vapor above you. High temperatures during the day. Mm -hmm. You have high temperatures of perhaps 30 degrees Celsius or 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And then at night, it gets very cold. It goes down to 32 Fahrenheit. And the reason for this is there is little water vapor above 12,000 feet okay. and therefore the radiation goes straight out to space so if you went down to sea level at that latitude the t hmm. night might go down to 80 fahrenheit 25 degrees celsius but it certainly wouldn't go down to almost freezing and this is the effect of the water vapor in the cloud yeah, now, the same if, thing that, yeah, I was just going to say this, the exact same thing happens in a desert. Yes. So if you're in the middle of a desert, it's dry. It can go below freezing during the nighttime and it can go extremely warm during the day. If you live near a coastline or near a lake or body of water, it's totally different. The temperature extremes reached are much lower 
right? You don't reach the same highs that you would reach or the same lows that you would reach. The temperature is more uniform. Take the extreme case, you know, go to the equator, same, yep. you know, it's pretty boring to be a weather, weather forecaster. Because you know, it's, it's a big thing. problem for weather forecasters is at night, because if you've got cloud cover uh, at the ground, then the temperature remains high. If you've got no cloud cover, the, right. the, the, the radiation goes out to space and the temperature drops. So, so um, Matt, I just noticed um, in Toronto, you know, if you, if you, in the winter, if you have a cloudy night, it's not going to be that cold at night. If the sky is completely clear, it becomes bitterly cold at night. Oh. For that very reason, it's the exact same thing happening. Okay, so now in trying to calculate the overall effect of clouds, what you've got several variables. One is, uh, one is whether the, the fact that the low-level clouds have an effect that's opposite to what high-level clouds have. And then in addition to that problem, there's the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere under close to the earth. Is that right? Which determines what? I mean, now we're not talking about, we, there was a talk about water vapor. I think maybe we should. Water vapor clouds, isn't it? So where am I lost? I think maybe we should take a little bit of a step back to get back to Jennifer's question a little bit. Um, I will mention with clouds, um, the fact that we can see clouds is because the water vapor that's in the atmosphere has condensed on into a liquid droplet or a solid droplet. So what's in the cloud itself is solid or liquid, but there's also gaseous water vapor um, around it and in the atmosphere when there isn't a cloud. Um, but let's put that to the side for a second. Um, if we go to, um, I believe Alan mentioned these stratocumulus clouds are very important. So if we go to the tropics, so if you think about um, the California fog, there's this big deck of stratocumulus clouds off the coast of California. Another one exists off the coast of South America and off the coast of Africa, these tropical decks. Um, I don't think you'd find anyone who would tell you that you can't get any kind of aerosol-induced brightening in these clouds. So going back to our marine cloud brightening, um, perspective no, um, no and I, I disagree this is the area, <laughs> this is the area where i would say you should concentrate your efforts because if you change the mean droplets people like fine gold people like rosenfield people like bjorn stevens would agree you change the mean droplet size by just a small amount you can change the, re the reflection and this is what Stephen Salter is trying to do. Now, the problem with that is you have to get the right size of aerosol. Because if you make them too big, they'll precipitate. The, the United Arab Emirates are spending millions, billions almost, and on making it rain. And if you make them too small, you'll dissipate the cloud. So this is a whole balance. And for example, off Chile, the, the smelters there actually produce lots of small particles and that removed some of the low level clouds. So I would argue that the smelters on the side of the Andes actually caused the planet to warm up because of not mean cloud, marine cloud brightening, but marine cloud dimming. So the situation is really, really quite complex, but the, the, the size of the mean, the radius, it's the R cubed over R squared, but the mean size of these particles in a cloud is critical for any, and this was done by Slingo, by Toomey, in it, all the numerical models in the world rely on trying to estimate how what the mean size of these particles is and to be honest the numerical weather forecasting models and climate models are a load of rubbish when it comes to it they just don't get it right you can go and measure it and it's nothing to do with what the forecasters say it is it's absolutely critical that's that's a very fair point in terms of um some of the complications, but I still think if you talk to um, 
Grim Feingold, who you mentioned, or others, I'm Grim Feingold's actually my advisor right now, um, they would agree that if you, well, take a heroic assumption right now, assume you have the right size, which we kind of know we do in at least some ship tracks, um, you can get brightening in these decks. And we have we observe that, um, and I have papers um, yeah, looking at yeah. that effect. And part of that is because um, from space, we often think of Earth as like a blue planet, right? And the blue is actually mostly from the atmosphere. If you just look at the ocean from space, it's essentially black. So sunlight that's getting into the ocean is not getting back out. The ocean's going to absorb basically all of the sunlight. So you then put a nice, bright, puffy cloud over the ocean, and you have a lot of leverage for reflecting that sunlight back to space. Now let's move over the Greenland ice sheet. You now have a couple kilometers of ice below you. You put a cloud above that, you're already reflecting all of the sunlight you would have otherwise because the ice is just so reflective itself. So the only effect the cloud can have left is warming. So that's why in the Arctic, when we're talking about surfaces that aren't particularly dark, but rather are quite bright. So Greenland is kind of an extreme example, but let's take the sea ice example. If you have sea ice that's already reflecting 40% of the sunlight and you put a cloud above it that is reflecting about 40% of the sunlight or something like that, you're not really getting a strong cooling effect, right? At least from the top of the atmosphere perspective, because you were already going to reflect that sunlight anyway. Um, mm -hmm. But you will still have the greenhouse effect of the clouds. Um, so that's why someone could reasonably be concerned about having this cause warming in the Arctic with similar physics. Um, another difference I will mention is that um, the Tumi effect we've mentioned and some of these arguments are true for liquid phase clouds and particularly what we call warm liquid phase clouds. That these are these clouds that are at temperatures above freezing. So they're in the, they're liquid droplets. If you start getting into regimes where you have ice formation, um, a lot more complicated processes start happening. And there's actually a really good paper from a couple of years ago looking at um, these ship tracks I think we've brought up. So these um, lines of cloud perturbations following individual ships that we can trace back to the pollution those ships emit. In the tropics and the subtropics, you can see pretty clearly on average those increase the cloud brightness. That effect is a lot um, weaker at higher latitudes when you have these clouds that are not just liquid, but a mixture of liquid and ice because those ship particles also affect the ice formation. Um, and that could cause these clouds to rain out more, et cetera. Um, so another question when we're talking about Hudson Bay, um, in the summer, are well, we getting let, clouds let, that let me, are- Let me see oh, if yeah. I, because uh, there you, yeah. you got me. If there's ice in the clouds, that's going to do what? It's going to more have a warming effect or, or I mean, you have to treat me like a child. I, I really, yeah. I, I want to understand this, but it's hard. Uh, the ice it has changes the effect in what way again? <coughs> the ice in the cloud. Yeah, so the ice in the cloud just makes more complicated processes start happening. So in the case of these ships, this might be different from what you are proposing in the Arctic, but let's just take the case of ships for right now, because that's what we already have observations of. The particles there can form new ice particles, not just new liquid particles. And if you form new ice particles, um, one way of thinking about this in kind of a simplified way is ice is a lot greedier for water vapor than the liquid is. So if you start forming some of those new ice particles, it actually starts stealing the liquid from other places and creates big ice crystals and snowflakes and starts causing precipitation, which causes those clouds to start going away. But, but, so if you farm, but, and create more ice in a cloud, you can dissipate or get rid of that Michael, cloud faster. Salt, you, look at, yes. you look at the geometry of the earth and you look north of 60 degrees and south of 60 degrees, that rep represents 5% of the cross-sectional area of the planet, 5%. It might represent, from 60 degrees north, it might represent 25% of the, of the surfaces, but it represents 5% of the cross-sectional area of sunlight coming into the planet. So we've now got 90, 90 to 95% 
of sunlight coming into the planet. And what you do in that 5% might help in the middle of the summer, but for the average over the year, <coughs> it's irrelevant. And I know it's very important if you live in the pole or near the poles, but in terms of the heat balance of the planet, anything north of 60 degrees north is I know Stephen's going to disagree with me. It's almost irrelevant for the whole heat balance of the planet. It's what's happening to not the other nine. <coughs> and that's why I like to focus this reflection <coughs> on the subtropics, because the sunlight is coming in perpendicular. <coughs> and you yourself, Michael, said in the subtropics, the, the strata cumulus cloud, the ship tracks reflect radiation. And during most of the year, the subtropics, you get a bigger bang for your buck. You, you've got more sunlight coming in, changing the reflectance a little bit, or send more back. In the Arctic, <coughs> it might be important in specific regions like the Hudson Bay, but in terms of the global heat balance, <coughs> Arctic clouds to me are they're interesting because I, I study clouds, but balance of the planet i mean i, I just don't think they're very important <laughs> that's my view the, the the average uh solar input is 340 watts per square meter that's over 24 hours over the whole year okay for a short time the the south pole gets 550 watts per square meter because it's coming in for 24 hours right. so provided you are able to pick and choose the latitude that you want to work at, you'll find it's a whole lot better to than, than if you just took the average mean. You, if you could be at more than 340 watts by being being able to move around very fast. And the yeah. whole point about the mean cloud patterning with uh, ships releasing spray is that they can be where you want to have them during the year. And we don't want to go too close to the ice in the Arctic, partly because the seawater is absorbing so much. And they say we want to get clouds over the sea rather than over the ice. But we also don't want to have our ships bumping into the ice. <laughs> we want to be well clear of the ice so we can work anywhere where your friends choose us to be. And this will certainly vary through the, the year. Uh, and we want to be migrating with the seasons. Uh, well, Danny to... Rosenfeld would say we should, in any clear area, we should spray aerosol. Now, he goes even further than we do. Mm. He says, any clear area, put aerosol in. Mm. Yeah. You get a and bigger he... reflect. Now, I don't quite agree with that, but he would go even further than Stephen. Yeah, he's predicting about double the effect that we're hoping for. I just yeah. wanted to make people see these two jars. Okay. Those are glass balls that are four millimeters in diameter. And these are glass balls that are 40 microns in diameter, 100 times smaller. And this is very nice pocket demonstration of the Toomey effect. OK, and the optics of this is really, really robust. This is what we're wanting to do. They're the same mass of glass, isn't there, in each one, yeah. Stephen? Same mass of glass mm. and a completely different reflectance. Yeah, yeah. That's the key point. Yeah. The big one look dark, absorb the, the solar yeah. radiation. The little well, ones... The, the, the mass can't be the same. The packing density is quite different. No, it's it's mass. Mass. It's right? There's going to be air gaps between the big, uh, the bigger um, spheres. No, 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 Much sphere. smaller than no, that no, between no, the no, lower no. smaller spheres. So. No, you, no, no. The <laughs> same ratio of glass to gap. Yeah. But before I forget, um, quick question to, to Michael and uh, Alan. Um, those ship tracks that you were talking about, the paper, the most recent paper said that um, they, they're actually, much, they have much larger effect than we thought because at first we were just looking at visible ship tracks and now we're looking at all of the ship tracks and then projecting them to where the wind would blow them and seeing cooling over that area. So there's a lot of invisible ship tracks and, and therefore, the global dimming effect, you know, if we shut off all aerosol production from industry, um, instead of being about half a degree Celsius um, warming from the re removal of aerosols, it's more like one degree 
So it means it's much more sensitive effect than we thought. And this is also confirmed, I think, from the 9-11 when there was no aerosols being produced by aircraft. The aircraft were shut down over the U.S. and Europe, you know, for, hey, for several days. Paul, help, help me again. I, I, I think I could almost understand you, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, Can I show you? Air, uh, oh, oh, we're talking oh, about oh. clouds, but we need to uh, also be aware of the uh, effect of the aerosols. Not just the the now indirect the, effect the air, of the okay. clouds, but when the we're talking effect. about the a, effect of the ship uh, sending these trails, yes. those are aerosols that are being produced. Is that what you're referring? Yeah, to? well, it's cry oh. it's basically incomplete combustion particles from the the bunker diesel. Um, you know, so, so there's is, black carbon. This is not there's aerosols. salt water. This is not salt water. This is aerosol which is different but is aerosol has the same effect as as these salt water particles or or not um, I'm sorry. that's where i'm confused is yeah is well the aerosol, aerosol, aerosol is which any... i'm not sure what i i'm not sure what the connection is or whether they're even the same thing aerosols and 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 uh, and cloud particles uh, aerosols are anything non-water let, right? me give like, you an ex let me give you an example of this. When Barack Obama signed the contract to desulfurize uh, fuel, the emissions from the ships changed. You got smaller, uh, you got different particle size. So the advantage of burning heavy sulfurous food, fuel, might kill off millions of people in the air with, especially in it might kill them off with air pollution because there's increased air pollution in places like India. <clears throat> the fuel cleaner actually warms up the planet because if you pump lots of sulfur or these aerosols into the atmosphere, then you're actually cooling the planet down. If you clean up fuel oil from ships, which is a major source, because ships usually use old, and there's a paper in Nature, I think, about this, saying Barack Obama cleaning up the fuel oil will actually increase the warming at the surface of the planet <coughs> because there's less reflected back to space by these aerosols. This is what Danny Rosenfeld says. We should be spraying not not. Hold on. So uh, uh, now, um, uh, here's let me let me struggle because I'm doing this for the sake of my listeners. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, other people are stupid as I am, so I'm I'm going to help them. <laughs> now, so these aerosols are not salt particles. We know that the salt particles which go up to the clouds will brighten the clouds, but these aerosols are dark things which will have. The effect of warming, but that doesn't figure. No, cooling the planet. Why would cooling it be cooling the... dark things? Why would they be cooling the planet? Because they be warming the planet. No, because they're not dark. Essentially, it's to do with the wavelength of in. So, if you put lots of sulfurous particles, they have names like PM 2.5, PM 10, which relates to their size. So if you put, it's like making the droplets in your clouds a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller, you could either warm up the planet or cool the planet. And it's only because if you get these droplets of <clears throat> a little bit small rain droplets, not cloud droplets, a bit smaller than they are now, they will reflect radiation. But if you pump out a lot of uh, sulfurous particles of a certain size, then it warms up the planet. So it, it's it, a it, the bigger the size, the more it's going to warm the planet. Yeah, See, that's no. Why I'm, no, yeah, that's this, I, I, maybe that's where I'm lost because I don't understand the logic of of what the size has to do. It sounds like it's it's opposite from what we're arguing about when you put. Uh, smaller water salt particles into the clouds yeah yeah it, it depends opposite? on the size of the particles you're putting into space so if you look at australia 
Australia is a, a great big open cast mine as far as I'm concerned, because <clears throat> there's huge amounts of coal and iron ore going to China. And if you look at the clouds produced, actually radiating out to space. And if you close down the mines, the planet reflects less to space. So it's you've got aerosols, and you sometimes call sea salt an aerosol, but it's different. You've got little bits of particles of clay, dust, dirt, whatever, sulfur from fuel. They're the aerosols, and then you have the cloud droplets. So the aerosols grow, they, water condenses on the aerosols to produce cloud droplets. And Stephen is showing the slide there, because that those are cloud droplets, he's showing, he's showing from he put the, the, the water forms on the aerosols. Stephen? Yeah, I just wanted to show you the, the, this set of 20 different grey bars going from black to white. Okay, so there's 5% difference between each bar. Now, uh, you, if you l look at a group of them to see how many bars do you need to count before you can tell which way the gradient is, it's three or four bars, okay, which is a 20% difference in contrast. And to see a ship track, you, you, you need to get at least at least 20 percent maybe 30 percent for it to show up against the background so that's a tremendous amount more than we need to save the planet we need to save the planet by about a half a percent contrast change if we did it everywhere and if we can only do it in 10 percent of the area we need to increase the contrast by five percent which is one bar and that means that you won't be able to see the change in the clouds from a, a, a cloud experiment but you'll still be cooling the planet Right, that's the grayscale. If anybody wants another grayscale with a different number of bars, it's very easy for me to produce it. All right, so 5% per bar going from white to black, 20 of them. Okay, I'm afraid I've uh, interrupted your dispute where you were having a, a, what makes sense to you, a logical argument, and I just stopped you to try to get you to make sure it's sunk in here. But... Um, so, so uh, I, I'll think further about this. Oh, here comes Ellen Judd. She wants to ask a question too. So maybe we can really discombobulate you between the two of us. Ellen. There's sort of a, a niggling thought in the back of my mind that there's been a great deal of discussion here about uh, how one uses certain kinds of aerosols at certain altitudes and so on. Um, but all of this is a dynamic system. So none of this is going to, to stay put. And I'm not hearing a, about uh, um, how is this going to interact yeah. with all of the other factors, the, 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 the currents, the, the levels of moisture, the rainfall. Yeah. Because we did a big experiment called Vocals off the coast of South America. And you had these cloud decks, right? Uh, and you flew underneath them for hours and the wind was almost zero. The, the, and this went on for days. So under these regions, what happened was you got a circulation. So the aerosol went up into these layer clouds dropped down, went up, and this went on for days and days and days. So in those regions, the air does really, <clears throat> it moves up and down a little bit, <clears throat> but these clouds are, in, you can see from one day to the next to the next, they're stable. And yet you can see, if you look at a mid-latitude storm, that, I mean, the air is it's completely dissipated. So spraying under the strata cumulus level, it will stay there for days and days and days. It's like smog. It will, could stay there for days. But over sea, there's nothing. The radiation at the top, the solar radiation, the infrared radiation, the dynamics all balance. And that is what's so amazing about these strata cumulus clouds and why the numerical weather forecast just can't understand them. There's no way 
the physics in a numerical weather forecast can actually get them right and it's because the air is stationary for days effectively it's interesting is it will that happen in general um no no oh no oh no and then in general there's lots of vertical motion in the atmosphere <clears throat> there's lots of what we call slant wise convection there's lots of vertical convection there's lots of overturning due to radiation at night but in these regions there is so little motion there's there's small eddies that go round and round maybe two kilometers in in size and they just go round up and down a little bit and the air, it rains out of the bottom the aerosol evaporate they go back in and people including graham fine gold and people like that have spent years look at the edge of these clouds to see how they break down and it's it's intriguing how this balance works a lot of cloud physicists are still trying to graham fine gold included are still trying to understand how these systems can work the supplementary question so are there a lot of places in which you could do this and do it stably um to to a degree that it's going to make a large difference or are these sort of anomalous and special circumstances well we argue that we can do it in these regions if you'd look at 10 percent five percent of the five to ten percent of the maritime is cover these clouds and if if you did it and that you could reduce it if it works and this is a big challenge will it work mm -hmm. i don't know whether it work but the 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 equations the radiation equations say if you do it in these five to ten percent region you can effectively compensate for double carbon dioxide for uh for watts per meter squared very easy. if it works and on one occasion, Richard Branson invited Stephen and I and uh, John Latham for dinner because he wanted to offset the carbon from his aircraft. <laughs> and he wanted the patent, didn't he, Stephen, for the, for the, he could offset. So he could say, I'm offsetting this emissions from my aircraft. But did um, you go to his island or something during the hurricane? <laughs> no, no. We met in we met in California when he's okay. after his first SpaceX crashed or something. Uh, okay. Um, uh, one one key point that um, that the public um, needs to do, the listeners, and, uh, and I'm sure Meta already knows this, but um, Stephen often points out that you know the spraying is, is absolutely useless over land. Right. There's loads and loads of aerosols yeah, in yeah. the air above land. Yeah. Um, it's when you go over the ocean, especially, uh, you know, away from any shoreline that the aerosol count drops. But there are some places of the ocean where the aerosol count is extremely high. For example, west of Africa, you know, where the, where the winds just blow the pick up the particles in the deserts and, and blow it off offshore. Um, and that's where the hurricanes spin up, which yeah. which then come to uh, North America. So so um, the, the spraying, you know, um, if you're wondering, yeah, I mean, the idea of spraying, you could if you're spraying on land, you need to have a prevailing wind like on an island carrying carrying the um, stuff over the ocean. So that's a key point. We're talking about like how many particles, Stephen, over the ocean compared to the land, like like a million times difference or something. Not, not a million. Uh, I think the range over the ocean is somewhere between 10 and 100. And over land... 10 and 100 particles per cubic meter. Cubic, per cubic centimeter. Cubic centimeter. And over land, it's 1,000 to 5,000. I can maybe, uh, if I do able to share screen, I could maybe find a map of them. Don't I, I, worry about that. I think I, what I'm a, a little bit apologetic about is diverting the dispute because we do need to tackle where it is that there's a controversy. And I, I wanted simplification for my own edification. Uh, so, uh, but let's go back to whatever it is that you folks disagree about, because I think there is a, a, a significant controversy that is meaningful and important. And, and it may even determine whether or not the whole idea of cloud brightening in, in Hudson Bay is a reasonable project. And, and that is, uh, I, I want you to go back to what it is that you're disputing and see if we can wind up or make any progress with that 
uh, you know, controversy before we we have another. Okay, so so the one side is spray over Hudson's Bay and uh, bring back the ice uh, in, in, in the, you know, cool in the summer so that the ice doesn't all disappear in the summer. It stays there. Um, and the other idea is that, no, it's not going to do anything at all. We should be spraying um, in the equatorial regions or regions less than 60 degree north. I, that, I really, do we agree that that is the controversy? Right is that there? the question? Yeah. I'm not sure. Is it? Except that that's what we're arguing about. I might add one more thing about how concerned we should be about the aerosol and clouds going over sea ice, and then also how concerned should we be that maybe the Arctic cloud dynamics, if you um, spray too many small particles, as we talked before, you could actually thin the clouds instead of thicken them. So I'd add those. And Arctic clouds, I think, have one more kind of mechanism. I won't go into the full physics than the subtropical clouds in terms of why they might be even more sensitive to thinning. Uh, can I show you an experiment uh, done to try and simulate the release of one uh, um, uh, spray vessel? Uh, if, you, if you do that, and you're looking for the clouds being a bit whiter, you, you, from, from one spray vessel, you won't be able to see it at all. It looks as if it's just ordinary clouds. But if you take a hundred images of different clouds that have been sprayed and add them together, you can see the that there is a, a, a useful amount of, of white. And I can show you a computer result if you could let me share screen. So can, what I've done is I've taken the algebra from to me, and I've used this to change the brightness of uh, things in the in this pattern. And then what I did was to apply the same algebra to a real cloud image, which is here. And you should be, we're hoping that we'd see some uh, uh, white plumes along here. And it's very difficult to believe that there is one there. You can actually see some here as well. Uh, but this would not be enough to persuade someone to spend a uh, uh, hundred million dollars. But if I take this image and uh, add it to a whole bunch of other images, I can see this brightening coming up. And the, this is enough to, to, to save the planet, this amount well, of brightening. Hold on, Stephen, what's the background? What is the, the stuff we do see, this swirly thing? What is well, that? You can see here is ordinary proper clouds. This is South America, and this is the area that Alan Gadin was talking about. And these are the, the patterns of clouds, all right? What I've done is I've, I've got a hundred different images from Rob Wood and put them together, average them and divided by a hundred. And I get this thing here where I can see these four plumes. She's showing you that we have made a difference to the brightness by uh, enough to save the planet. Although you can't see it at all on that one. The, so the hundred different cloud images average up to that. Yeah, I think that the basic that picture there is is the average average strata cumulus cloud over a period of weeks. It isn't like that; it's more distributed. But if you average the number of droplets there of clouds, that is that is what a, a numerical model hopefully will produce. Yeah. that sort of thing over maybe a few days. In fact, they don't do it is, is a real problem for climate models. Climate models do not get these clouds. They're, they're compl and Bjorn Stevens in a in max. Right. He laughs at this because the climate models do not get the clouds radiative properties. And so we've got a real challenge from the numerical modeling you can do Michael, or you can do uh, Graham's high resolution studies and you can see a signal. I've shown it. But whether this works in, in practice, the only way you're going to do it is actually, and it, the experiment will only cost 40 or $50 million, I think. You get a few research aircraft to measure it, the droplet sizes. But until someone does it, uh, we just don't know. But well, Alan, would would the the Hudson Bay experiment be a, a good test? Well, 
well you've got to get the right cloud so so the the best example is to do it where the clouds exist and try it there and these sorts of clouds you know exist they know they're there every every year every month or whatever do it there and if it works there then it's likely to work in other places but mm. you really do need to operate three or four five research aircraft you need spray generators and you need the ability to measure the drops to see if it will work Alan, i i i think we can get it uh, off satellite images i don't know don't think you need to have aircraft these are all just satellite images uh, yeah well maybe i don't know whether i agree with you or not stephen <laughs> I think you need both, in my view. Okay, now let's go back to my big question, which is what is uh, the whole uh, controversy uh, about? Uh, what do we disagree about? Well, well let's go back to, my, to um, my, Michael was talking about some other differences between Arctic clouds and uh, subtropical clouds. And okay. then Stephen came on, so he didn't finish what he was going to say. That's, all right, good. Yeah, so I think some of the differences that might be controversial for why might um, we have questions about it in Hudson Bay in particular. So those questions of if you have the clouds over sea ice, not just over open ocean, you could get a warming effect. Um, are these clouds maybe more sensitive to drying out instead of brightening? That might be one. Um, and then I think the question, we didn't talk about it too much, but of... Um, cloud phase if these aren't just liquid clouds but they also um are there ice clouds are there other processes we need to be um thinking about one thing i'll throw out i'm kind of meanly at the end because i don't really have time to talk about it but um there are folks who actually have argued that in the winter what maybe you want to do is seed clouds with ice to get rid of them to thicken the sea ice then and then hope it lasts more into the summer so that's another kind of question um if you want the sea ice in the summer, does that necessarily mean you want to target the summer? It might not. It might mean you want to thicken ice in the winter and have um, it no, last we, for longer. We, we want to make we want we want to operate in the summer half part of the year. So we'd go we do the stuff in the summer. And we'd want to see the brighter brighter clouds by averaging them. Now, right. Leave the water uh, a little bit cooler than it would have been, so the ice might form a little bit more when the winter comes. But what Michael is saying, it might be more effective to um, not do anything in the summer, but to reduce, remove clouds in the winter to thicken the ice then. He's saying that would need to be looked at too. The difference in the reflectivity of clouds and ice isn't very much. I want to have the black water, the dark, very, very dark water, uh, having more clouds over it than without the the, the the spray so i want that's to... where, that's, no but but that's... Stephen, in the winter it's dark right there's no light so yeah. if you remove the clouds in the winter then there can be a lot more radiation out to space which will cool the cool the whole region and thicken the ice so so that might be very effective way of doing it as opposed to looking at the summer i, um, I that's right i did a little paper about making very small yeah. aerosol which does clear clouds hmm. uh, if we if we move the norwegian I, this yeah. is where I, mean, I disagree. This is okay. where I disagree slightly with Stephen okay. in saying that look, I'm not worried about the poles. They only represent five percent of the cross-sectional area, twenty percent of the globe. So Stephen and I have a slightly different approach. It okay, well, well, the why cool don't we cool planet down? And then the it will cool way. Hudson Bay even more. Okay, isn't the easiest way to get a better handle on what's going on is to just have a, a, an aerosol generator on a ship and, and uh, you know, just capture the, run, run the emissions from a smokestack through water or whatever so it doesn't go up into the air, you know, just tilt the smokestack and pump stuff into the ocean instead and then have generators, particle generators of all types on the ship. As the ship is transversing, you know, its regular route, you can see you know, what's happening from satellite measurements. How would that cost 50 million? The problem is that the particle size has to be very mono. It has to be up. Because if you make the particles come up too big, you will maybe cause condensation precipitation. If you make the particles too small, 
you'll do what that you'll just remove the clouds as well this this cloud physics is really people don't appreciate how complex it is because you've got infrared radiation solar radiation dynamics air going round you've got dynamics of the large scale dynamics of subsidence it's a huge hugely complex system and cloud physicists i think get look i think we can agree, only two of us will agree on this but i really <laughs> overlooked the fact that it's so complicated and it's so detailed I, and I, 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 want people, to, I want to spray uh <laughs> salt water and i want to spray them uh, uh, with a very controlled size yeah. And I can make all this fit into an ISO sea container, and that can be on land, or it could be on a very small island in the middle of the, there are a few islands in the Hudson Bay, or it could be on the, the deck of the ship. But when it's, on a, when it's on a deck of a ship, I don't want the ship to be releasing other materials, which other sizes and right. chemical nature that I don't understand. So we, this is why I think I'd rather do it from a land point and rotate the images of the clouds that we're making to make them all be in the direction of the wind. And that will let us see the, the, the wakes uh, from this, this, this uh, source um, by averaging them up. Apply for the, the, the hundred, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a prize by the royal family, right? Uh, Millions of pounds per year, 10 different projects. It's going on until 2030. Um, or, you know, I'm sure Elon Musk, you know, if he can spend 44 billion on Twitter and make it down to 6 billion in three weeks, I'm sure he could spare some cash if you just, <laughs> so, it's, so it's a matter of getting some funding from somebody to get a, yeah. get a device on a ship, like make a shipping container size unit and then you're set, right? From there, you just, you know, all the, all I the, ask one app I agree, that, Paul. we need to wind this up and I need to ask yeah. one question, simple. Do we agree that doing what Stephen has just proposed, which is not even clear what he's proposed, but sort of, I know what he's doing. Does everybody think there'd be value in doing that? Or is, is there really any doubt that it's even going to be worthwhile doing? Yes, I think it's an experiment that needs to be done. And the only way we're going to find out if marine cloud brightening works is if we actually do it. <laughs> we should do it where, where the chance of success is greatest, and that might not be Hudson's Bay then. Uh, it might not be, but if but it's... Hudson's the... Bay is within Canada, so you don't need international buy-in. You know, it's, it's all within Canada. So that's the one of the big things pushed for Hudson's Bay, right? If we could... But do you them. have the clouds, the right clouds? That's the... To get right. the bigger signal, and I don't know. That's mm -hmm. Michael. Right, right. I don't know. I don't. How do we find out whether we have the conditions that are required to make this experiment worthwhile? Like where whether the clouds are, are right. Okay. So. Well, Michael and Alan can look at some satellite images of Hudson's Bay clouds, and they can tell us in a week or two, right? Yeah. <laughs> a month, maybe. <laughs> Do we need yep. another session like this? Because this has really been hard for me to follow. And I, I hope our we have some listeners here or will you know an audience that has persisted. But uh, I, I'm happy to come back at it again, however often we need to do it in order to get it uh, um, something that we can comprehend and that we have some consensus about what we agree on or don't agree on. Uh, we can do a quick experiment now with a, a computer package called Windy. Uh, if you let me share a screen again, I'll see if I can do it while you wait. And we we'll want to go to Hudson's Bay, which is uh, up here. And what we want to do is look at the cloud fraction. So I've... This is what's happening there now. Okay, that's that's this three minute here. You can see the direction of the wind going. I'm going to look at clouds here. Right now, that's where the clouds are in Hudson's Bay at the moment. Are these these dots uh, the clouds? The white the white is the cloud fraction. So there's not much, there's there's no cloud in this area here.
that's low clouds, that's medium clouds, and that's high clouds. And we, what we want to do is, uh, there's not much in the way of high clouds by the look of it. It looks as if, if we've got medium ones there and low ones here. And it's the low ones we can get at. So the brown is clear sky. Okay. And the... That's, but the, the problem, you have to do it at the best time of year. And I agree with Stephen, this is not a good time of year to do it. No. You'd want to do it in the summer. And how much cloud there is in the summer, we don't know yet. Yeah, from here. So we could run this program in the summertime. We've got, yes. two, we've got two weeks either side of the, of where, of the day's date. Yeah, so I think maybe to, to summarize in a way that might be a little bit more helpful, what we could do is we could look at satellite images and find out in the summer, when do you have low clouds that are not obscured by high clouds? Because if there's yeah. another cloud in the way, it doesn't really matter how. Right. It doesn't matter what that other lower cloud is doing. Um, and so you could look, look at, at that from satellites. And you could also do numerical modeling. So if you have a regional model of this part of Canada that does clouds and sea ice at least moderately well or moderately realistically, you could see how does this proposal work in model world? And that would give us a sense of what kinds of effects could we expect in reality. But I would start with the model experiments before spraying anything in the real world. Right. And then overlay the clouds with the sea, where the sea ice is at that time. So see how many of those clouds are over open water. Yeah. The satellites should give us this answer very quickly because they've got yeah. they're saving them, storing them. Now my question is, do we is there a reason to resume this conversation and hope that we have uh, some data that will make it possible to move forward a little bit? Because I'm not sure still whether we've made any progress in getting um, some understanding that's con uh, generalized here that everybody understands and we agree on. Do we need a follow-up? Well, I think we should, um, you know, go away and have a look at these things we're talking about. Clouds over Hudson's Bay, you know, sea ice, from sat both satellite and, and so on, and uh, try to come up with, you know, once we have a bit more info, then, then uh, you know, have, a, have another follow-up meeting. Now, one of the one of the things that I'm hoping to do in probably the next uh, session on this topic about the Hudson Bay Project is to invite some indigenous people or at least one indigenous leader, because these are the people whose lives will be Im immediately affected by the project if we do it. And we hope beneficially so rather than detrimentally. Uh, but we need to consult them. What do they want? Uh, mm -hmm. Would they, would their lives be improved if they had ice returned and restored uh, throughout the year in their region? And how important is that to them and so on? So uh, we don't have those contacts yet, but I'm, okay. I'm looking out for for uh, contacts with some Indigenous people. Um, the, the Conference on Biodiversity, uh, COP15, is is starting in a couple of days in Montreal. It runs for two weeks. Um, and... Uh, you know, it's all on biodiversity. It's got, you know, there might be some stuff on, there's going to be a lot on Canadian biodiversity, including probably the Hudson's Bay region. I'm attending the conference, so I'll keep my eyes open on anything that is relevant to Hudson's Bay. Thank you all. I appreciate it very, very much. And I um, hope to see you again sometime soon with progress. Thanks. Thank Bye. you, Matt. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Project Save the World produces these shows. This is episode number 529. Uh, watch or listen to them as audio podcasts on our website um, to save the world.ca. People share information there about six global issues. If you want to find a particular talk show, enter its title or episode number in the search bar or the name of one of the guest speakers. Project Save the World also produces a quarterly online publication, Peace Magazine. You can subscribe for $20 Canadian per year. Just go to pressreader.com on your browser and in the search bar enter the word peace. You'll see buttons to click to subscribe.